today. This man got up out of his bed, gravely ill, and came to the Mosaic Temple to be presented a check for the sickle cell summer camp for youth that he was sponsoring this coming summer. That gave me much inspiration to see him do that. So if we could just take a moment of silence to remember Mr. Johnson uh, as a great individual, but more importantly, how he fought all of his life to expose us and others about sickle cell. Join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Before we get started, I have to read this disclaimer that I've been asked to read for, or to read to each of you. Uh, and, it, and it reads as this. According to ANCC COA criteria, there is no commercial support for this continuing education offer. The speaker has no conflict of interest as a presenter of this class. The speaker will not be discussing off-label use of drugs or equipment. To receive continuing, continuing education credit, the participants must attend full educational offering. Now, we have a theme this year. Does anybody know our theme? If you don't know it, you will know it before you leave for this evening. The theme is Hope on the rise, on the horizon. Say that with me. Hope. Okay, let's try it again. Say, Ken. Hope on the horizon. Join the chain to stop the pain. Here's what that means. There is hope that one day sickle cell will find a cure. But in between now and then, it is our hope that we continue to make people more aware, particularly the medical profession, more aware of how to, uh, how to uh, positively affect an individual's life who is experiencing sickle cell uh, attack once they go to the hospital. If you, join the, if you join the chain, which is us, Future Builders, the Black Nurses Association, then we can eventually stop the pain for those individuals. So what's the, what's, what's the theme for this year? Hope on the horizon. Join the chain to stop the pain. That's good, but you missed one word. Yes. That's right, king. Let's try it over again. What's the theme? King. king. Hope on the horizon. Join the chain to, to stop the pain. the pain. Very good, very good. I'm going to ask you that again before we leave. It is my honor to present our first uh, pre uh, presenter this evening, and it is Mr. Charles Stewart. But before he comes, let me tell you a little bit about Charles that's not in his bio. Charles has uh, been a first of doing many things in his life. But those of you who are not from, from Little Rock, of the Little Rock community, you may not know what I'm getting ready to share with you. <clears throat> Charles was the first black man, black individual, to join the management training program at First National Bank. It was a big, big deal. The state press was still in operation, and it was front page news in the state press. And that's when I first encountered Charles Stewart. And on that day, I said to myself, one day I'm going to be like Charles. I may not be his size, <laughs> but I can be first in my life like he has done. Other things that Charles has done first uh, in this community, of course, he is the co-founder and chair of the Arkansas Black Hall of Fame. It is an organization that has done great things in this community and is a sponsor, and is a sponsor uh, of this event tonight. So put your hands together. <coughs> And welcome another first, Mr. Charles Stewart.
Thank you very much and good evening to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today and to be uh, a part of this uh, symposium and to uh, thank my friend Ken uh, for inviting us, inviting the Black Hall of Fame uh, Foundation to be a part and giving us the opportunity to support something that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I am, um, let me tell you a little bit about the Hall of Fame for those of you who may not know. Uh, we were started in 1992 and the purpose for starting it was initially um, to recognize the accomplishments of African Americans who uh, have accomplished national, attained national and or international acclaim in their chosen field. They're African Americans with Arkansas roots and Arkansas connections. That was our initial purpose and we were uh, pulling it together uh, as a uh, fundraiser for the Minority Business Council, the Arkansas Minority Business Council. And we partnered with them for about 10 years and then in 2002, uh, we decided to form our own foundation and that foundation uh, since uh, 2002 has given grants out to organizations that are working to improve health and wellness, uh, youth development, education, and economic development in black and other underserved communities throughout the state of Arkansas. And to date, our grants have impacted over 52 of Arkansas's 75 counties. And uh, we continue to be very proud of the work that we're doing uh, through uh, the foundation to support different projects for health and wellness. The first thing, one of the first, uh, the first year that we existed, the, um, the Arkansas Black Hall of Fame, the very first inductee into the Black Hall of Fame was Dr. Maya Angelou. And I think that you know that we lost her this year. Uh, also that year was another outstanding Arkansan named Dr. Stanley Ish. And, and if you know Dr. Ish, that's sort of, uh, I mean, he was a trailblazer. Uh, years ago, before integration, there was a hospital called United Friends Hospital over on 11th and then High Street, what is now Martin Luther King. And, and Dr. Ish was a part of starting that, helping to start that, and many other firsts. And many of the people that we've inducted into the Black Hall of Fame um, have been in the medical profession. Dr. Edith Irby Jones, the first uh, graduate from the University of Arkansas Medical Science campus. Dr. Joycelyn Elders, uh, Dr. James Hildreth. And Dr. Hildreth is a research scientist uh, in um, uh, in micro, uh, microbial uh, science, and he developed, helped to develop a microbial cream that uh, is a vaginal cream that prevents the transmittal of the AIDS virus, and it's a game changer because in many countries around the world, uh, it puts for the first time uh, control in the woman's hands of her reproductive health and, and then her ability to uh, prevent the transmission of that disease. And so uh, these are people that we have honored. Dr. Uh, uh, Samuel Kuntz, and those of you who know Dr. Kuntz perfected the technique for kidney transplantation and did research in the rejection factor which made all other kinds of organ donations possible. And so we uh, come here today to uh, support this uh, effort on sickle cell. Sickle cell, to me, is a disease that uh, many people um, suffer in silence, or not silence, but in private. And so unless you have someone that you are, are that's in your family and they're doing it, when they start having their, their episodes, they, they, or their crisis, they, they go and, uh, and they're out of, out of public. They don't go to school. They don't go to work. Uh, and so I have come to understand and appreciate this through Jermaine Johnson, because Jermaine, for the first time, uh, he, he brought it out in public. And he let you really see 
what he was going through. And so it's like, yeah, they got sick of that. I mean, that, that was kind of how I think most of us who are not connected to it saw it. And, and, but we came to understand the uh, severity of this and the impact of it and the necessity to do something. And so we uh, have supported their program now, I think, for three years and maybe for three years. And, uh, and so it was our privilege and our pleasure to be able to support this in partnership with um, Future Builders and the Black Nurses Association. And we thank you for allowing us to be a part of this, and we thank you for allowing us this uh, opportunity to speak with you this evening. Thank you very much. But let me let me do this. Let me do this before uh, Ken is on our our board as well. And may I introduce Sylvia Smith, uh, who is also a member of the Arkansas Black Hall of Fame team. And in October, October the 18th, mark your calendar. This uh, this will be the 22nd annual Arkansas Black Hall of Fame induction ceremony, and it is through that ceremony that we actually raise money to then put out in the form of our grants through our foundation. So we invite you to come and to be a part of that. Thank you very much and good evening. Thank you. Charles, uh, we certainly uh, thank the, the, the Black Hall of Fame for your support, but if you would join me back up center stage, please. Our little small gift that we like to present to you on behalf of Linda Conley, the Executive Director of Future Builders, Cheryl Martin, President of the Little Black Nurses Association, and Ken Wade. Okay, checking pictures up is right now. Nice. <laughs> but thank you, Charles, and thank the Black Hall of Fame. Thank you so yes, much. Sir. Thank yes, sir. You. Okay, what time is it now, everyone? It is what time? Door prizes. Door prizes. Okay, we're going to get to that. <laughs> but before the end, we're going to hear a word from the president of the Little Rock Black Nurses Association, Cheryl Martin. Let's welcome Cheryl up. Good afternoon. I apologize we don't have a mic, but I think we're all loud enough that you can hear our voice as well. I would like to have, a, um, I have the pleasure of inviting, first of all, I will say from the Little Rock Black Nurses Association, we thank you all for coming out this afternoon and um, joining us in this effort. And before I get started, they all know, always know I ask all the Little Rock Black Nurses to please stand. Please stand, members. So we from Little Rock Black Nurses, and, um, thank you guys for coming out this afternoon and taking time out of your schedule for our Sickle Cell Symposium. I would like to introduce Dr. Cheryl Smith. Um, she's our keynote uh, speaker this afternoon. Dr. Cheryl Smith has taught community health nursing to the baccalaureate nursing program since 1975. She is actually a tenured faculty member a certified nurse educator and a fellow in the National League for Nurses Academy of Nursing Education and American Nurse Association Academy of Nursing. Dr. Smith has been a volunteer nurse in the American Red Cross since 1974 and has taught disaster preparedness education to healthcare professionals, nursing students, and community members throughout the United States. She collaborated with a team of other Red Cross nurses to develop a course to prepare pre-nursing, um, pre-licensed nursing students to serve as volunteers in the Red Cross, disaster shelters which is now being taught in nursing programs throughout the country. Dr. Smith has received several awards related to her Red Cross work, including a regional and Magnuson Award, a chapter level Clara Barton Volunteer Leadership Honor Award, and the 2011 International Committee of the Red Cross Florence Nightingale Medal. Dr. Smith is a retired lieutenant. She is a retired lieutenant colonel in the United States Army Nurse Corps and a veteran of the 1991 Gulf, Gulf War. So, without further ado, we will have a short intro talking about sickle cell disease. And after we do that, then you will have Dr. Cheryl Smith. Thank you.
I don't have a remote, so I'll be kind of going back and forth, but I don't want to block your view. Can you see over here? Okay. We've got a, a, just a couple of things. I remember learning about sickle cell disease when I was in nursing school back in the early 60s, late 60s. And I just turned 65 a couple weeks ago, and I'm proud to be alive. But I remember hearing about the disease and from a clinical perspective, but I never really took care of a lot of people with the disease. And now that I've been in nursing for many years, I can see what a horribly painful disease it can be. And there's a lot of discrimination that goes along with it. I remember in a hospital in Ohio, we had a uh, kind of middle-aged African-American man who came to the hospital in acute pain. The immediate assumption was drug-seeking. That was just the stereotype. And they didn't realize at the time he had sickle cell, and so they finally figured it out. He was a prince from an African nation, so he was not a drug addict. He was in acute pain from sickle cell. Who knows what the other population is that is prone to sickle cell besides the um, African Americans? Well, some. Mediterraneans, remember that? There are others besides those of you in this room that may know Mediterranean to have it, but it's not as common. And who knows why the blood does that? What disease is it protecting you against? Malaria. Very good, malaria. <clears throat> and I'm wondering if in the countries that still have a high rate of malaria, they, I wonder if they still have a lot of more rate of sickle cell and if that really does protect them. That would be a great research study. Trauma, cancer, major surgery, they're going to have more and more frequent blood transfusion reactions. So in response to that, the Red Cross developed this course that they are hoping that we can get out there among nurses and nursing students all over the United States to spread the word that we have got to increase our blood donations among minority populations. And you'll hear more about that as we go through. I'm going to give you just kind of a review of that course. The objectives of this course are to increase the number of first-time blood donors at blood drives primarily educational institutions. At UAMS, where I teach, we have a monthly blood drive competition among all the colleges, and nursing wins quite often, um, and medicine sometimes beats us, but now that they have more women in the program, used to be the male dominant programs would have more because we're so anemic, well now we're sort of tied with medicine. Improve the donor experience by minimizing stress and fear about the donation process, which will lead to increased donor retention. Is there anyone here who will admit to never having donated blood? Is there, are you offered an opportunity or are you just not? I saw the needle and just changed. Okay, very common. You're, you're normal. You're there is a lot of fear connected with giving blood. And I never look at the needle. I look somewhere else when I try to donate because it's, it's a size of 16 gauge. Widen the educational reach for individuals who are not routine blood donors. We have got to get out into the communities and we're hoping that nurses, who are the most trusted professionals, get out there and talk to church groups, youth groups, um, educational programs, scouts, whatever you can do to get the word out. Scouts might be too young, but when they get to the age where they're allowed to donate, then they would be a great population because they're already very community oriented. So if you can learn what this program is about, then hopefully you could take it and use it yourself. Just to give you a bit of a background, in 2008 and 2009, the National Nursing of the American Red Cross established a biomedical work group, and they tried to figure out how to get the Red Cross reactivated and get nurses more involved. <clears throat> Up until 1993, from 74 to 93, I helped with blood drives. I did the finger sticks, I did the blood draws, what happened in the 80s that started to scare people? HIV. HIV. When that hit, the Red Cross, for liability reasons, would not use people like me any longer. You had to be an employed Red Cross worker to do the blood drives. You could do the handing out the cookies, and you couldn't even do the blood, the blood pressures and the histories because we were not certified under the liability. We didn't have more salary. So we had to quit doing them. And they're starting to rethink that. I think they're going to go back. But we're trying to get our Red Cross nurses to be involved in something other than disaster. So they launched a program originally called Protecting Life, Promoting Health. 
and they started it in the Wisconsin area, up in north central Arkansas, the north, north central part of the country, and they used nursing students, because nursing students are learning to teach community groups, and they're very enthusiastic, very young, and excited, want to go out into the community, and they actually can count this as credit in their nursing program, sometimes for clinical hours, sometimes for service, if they have a service requirement in their program. And St. Francis Medical College in Peoria, Illinois, was the first school that did this, but it's pretty much stayed in that area. When they first taught the course, 358 people heard this presentation. 72% of those receiving the presentation were more likely to be their first time or repeat blood donor. Because some people who are needle phobes say after the first time, never again. But is there a way that we can get over that so that people will still donate? They did see a slight increase in production of blood donations during that time. And there were promising results. Something happened to the slides here. I think it went off the end. But I'm going to just give you an idea of what's in this program. It's led by the National Nursing Network. We have state and regional nursing leaders. I was the first state nurse liaison here in the Red Cross here to the national level. Then I got onto the National Nursing Committee, so I got two colleagues to take over the state nurse liaison. And we're trying to reorganize and get more people. So if any of you would like to become involved in the Red Cross, anyone know Keisha Herbie, the VA? She's been one of our regional of uh, blood, not blood, but the whole regional nursing program. We're trying to get nursing programs and nurses in the community to learn how to teach the community about giving blood. And they actually have a whole program. You don't even have to create anything. They have a PowerPoint, they have handouts, frequently asked question handouts, um, a letter to the agency where you're going to do a blood drive or to the church or the community. Everything is completely created. All you do is take the material and run with it. There is a requirement that you connect with the blood donation folks in your community. And I know they had a blood drive here. Did anybody donate? They had a blood drive here at St. Vincent's. We tried to get it for this evening, and I don't think they were wanting to stay that late. And so we're trying to get it underway where, besides nursing students, we can get nurses to teach. We're also working with nursing schools and hoping to create this as a service activity. In our program at UAMS, our students have to go to meetings and do service activities to graduate because that's part of our mission is service. So learn how to be nurses and they become leaders. And so this is one of the possibilities where we can have them learn how to do this and go out and do the presentations. And then we're going to also work with the donor recruitment staff, the people that set up the blood drives. If you have a church a community group that wants to have a blood drive, you connect with your local Red Cross blood donor recruiter person and they will organize it. And I think, is that who you worked with to get, you were trying to get one for tonight or today? Yes. And so they're right down across from the zoo on Monroe. And you have to have regional leadership. You have to make sure that the chapter that you're working with is interested in this. This is a new enough program so that faculty and nursing students have to lobby in many states where they say, why would we want nurses involved? They, they're so used to not having us anymore because of the HIV scare back in the 80s. So we have to re-educate our blood donation staff so that nurses can help them get the, the word out. You need a point of contact, and we have somebody at the Red Cross chapter here that I've been talking to and sharing this information, and they're very interested in having us help them. Uh, you need to make sure that you have a way of drawing people to it because you don't want to have just two people in the room. So you try to get an organization where you'd have maybe a church <coughs> meeting and do it in a fellowship hall and have coffee and donuts and do your presentation. And then there are ways to get feedback from people. How many of you decide to donate because of this presentation, how it went. And then you get collaborative partnerships with nursing programs. To be a nursing student doing this, obviously in a current nursing program, you need to have presentation skills and experience. How many of you remember your first presentation you had to do and how scared you were? And think about that as a learning experience. So that's one of the things we teach our students how to do health education. So we're hoping that as mature nurses, we can mentor our younger nurses so that they can become good presenters. You need teaching experience, which they get in nursing school. They have to learn how to teach patients, small groups, families. 
be very professional. They could, when they do this, they could wear their uniform and a lab coat and, and have people recognize them as a professional, pre-professional. Ideally, once they learn how to do this presentation, or you learn how to do it as a, a, reg a registered nurse, do it more than one time. Don't just do it and never do it again, because once you get good at it, then you can become more experienced and not have to look at the notes all the time. You'd be able to carry through on the logistics and then have a faculty member, a cheerleader, a faculty member that can help you set it up. But as nurses, you can set your own program up. You don't have to go through the nursing program. Just to give you an example of what's in that toolkit, uh, there's an evaluation form for the people who come. They can actually say how it went. Uh, there's a checklist for you as the faculty, bring equipment that works, uh, have room and they have refreshments. It has the actual PowerPoint presentations. It has a short one and a slightly longer one. It gives you materials like handouts about the Red Cross, uh, blood donation, frequently asked questions, how to prepare, things like don't come dehydrated, make sure you've eaten a good meal. Um, if you're not the high, high enough weight, you have to be, I think, 105 pounds. <coughs> and most of us can probably meet that, and I think you have to be at least 17. <laughs> I wish I could have a problem meeting that. And then what island, uh, why it's important and what kinds of foods you eat. So it has all kinds of information with fact sheets, summaries, and they also have ways of ex re rewarding or recognizing someone who do does this program. You can get a certificate of completion to put in your portfolio, uh, you can get a pin. I'm wearing the RN, registered nurse pin. This goes way back to the very beginning of the Red Cross nurses. And then there's a student nurse version of it. This is slightly different color blue. And we can give these out as, as a way of recognizing them. And then there's a thank you letter that we can also process. So everything is already created. Just a few examples. Don't, don't try to read this, but this would be um, a letter to the church the community group saying we would like to do this presentation. So it's already written, you just fill in the blanks. This is one of the slides that's in that program. I'm not going to show you the whole program, but it says what is blood, uh, four main components, and what it's made um, to be very simple for people who aren't really into biology. It gives you the types of blood, and if you notice the red bold, if you are O negative, you can give to anybody. If you are AB positive, you can receive blood from anyone. What's not on here is what I've added to this presentation that wasn't part of the original program. There's a next slide. Then it, shows, it goes and walks you through the process so people have never been, been to a blood donation drive. It tells you where you go and where the blood goes from there and how it's processed up through the system. And then here are some of the frequently asked questions. And this is also put on the handouts that you can give out during the presentation. Who can donate? Here's where it's 17 years or uh, may have to have parental permission. It's 110 pounds. It used to be 105. In good health, no upper age limit. And depending on what your circumstances are, there are certain drugs you have you can't be on, um, certain diseases. I remember coming back from Desert Storm with my unit coming back and not no one in that unit could give because they've been exposed to the sand flies or sand fleas that cause leishmaniasis. So they're permanently barred. If you've lived in England for more than three months, mad cow disease, you're not allowed to give blood because it stays in the body for so long that you're, you're permanently barred. So those are some of the examples. How often could you donate? At least every 56 days between donations of whole blood. 16 weeks for double red cell, and then you can do platelets every seven days. So that's a lot more often. I don't know why that keystone thing keeps flashing up there. It takes about an hour. I know when I've given, if they get the right blood, if they get the right vein, 10 minutes and I have a pint or a unit. But if they get the wrong one, half hour later, they still don't have a whole one. So I always say use this vein, don't use any of it. So you have to educate the donors. Uh, these didn't look like the sound of my computer. It must be some translation with the LCD. And so I'm not going to go through these in great detail, but it, you can see where it educates people on what's hemoglobin, what is iron, how do we measure, why do we measure the iron, so that you don't make the donor anemic and you don't give not high quality blood, you, know, you give better quality blood to the recipient. And then it gives you 
facts to talk about and get people motivated. Like every two seconds, somebody needs blood for cancer, sickle cell disease, <coughs> 70,000 people, 1,000 babies are born every year with sickle cell. Car accidents, you might have up to 100 units of blood in one car accident. Here's a, a little story about a girl with sickle cell disease. When she was five years old, she fell off her bike and she got acute chest syndrome. That's when they found out she had sickle cell. And it left her in a coma for a while, but then she eventually got her first red blood cell exchange and she's been able to maintain stability. But this was before they realized that those antibodies are a problem if you don't get a good matched blood. And this I fixed it and it's still, it's not coming across, but so I'm just going to have to point out what these are. Rare blood types by ethnic group. You can see that African Americans have unusual antibodies that they've discovered recently. Native Americans, Alaska Natives, Pacific Islands, Islanders and Asians, Hispanics, East European Russian Jews, so those of you who are the Jewish population may have some sickle cell problems, and then Caucasians. So I give my blood to one of the black women or men in this room. If you get more, every time you get a transfusion that's not matched exactly to your blood, you're setting yourself up for future transfusion reactions. And that's a relatively new discovery, so they're trying to let people know we don't have enough donations from the minority groups. And you can see every single group, it's not just blacks and whites, okay? It is all of these groups. There's a little boy with cancer and blood and platelets kept him alive. A star athlete who had a serious accident, so she got the O negative universal blood. She was one of those who hated needles, and never voluntarily go near one, and now she donates blood. So here's some examples of places that have had this course. In pilot testing, over 300 individuals attended one of the sessions and almost three-fourths of them said they would donate. Nursing students who did the presentations learned to themselves the value of it, and they said yes, they would go on and donate. And then they, the attendees thought the students did a great job and wanted to hear more. So when you're presenting, you can decide, say you want to go to your church, when would you do it, how many people do you think will come, maybe find a way to get refreshments, have AV equipment set up, have all your handouts run off, and then you can go ahead and do it as short as a 15 minute presentation. If you've only got a half hour between events, you could do 15 minutes of presentation and 15 of questions and answers. And as nurses, we can do that, we're very flexible. And we already know that we're the most trusted profession, so we can take advantage of that. So if you're interested in hosting a blood drive, you tried to get one this evening, but I know you had one here today. But that would be a great presentation if you wanted to do one in a church. Do this presentation maybe on a Saturday or Friday and then uh, do the blood drive on Sunday in between church services and provide the refreshments that you would have at a your coffee, coffee hour. We've done this for 125 years, but we don't have enough volunteers. And that is the website that you can go to if you want to host a blood drive, or you can just call the Red Crosses. 748-1000 is the one here on the road down across from the zoo. Here are the regions for the biomedical blood services. They've recently reorganized. We are down to three regions. And you can see the colors. The blue one is a huge region. That's like half the United States. And they have to coordinate all the blood services in that entire area. And then there's another one, kind of the gray, and then the orange. So we don't have a lot of infrastructure at the national level, there are volunteers in each of these states that work with individuals like yourselves that are living in that program, in that area. If you're interested in learning more about this material, you need to connect with your Red Cross chapter. And then Dr. Littlefield, a Red Cross colleague of mine who is the nurse consultant for this program, is going to respond to emails and she'll answer pretty much any time and talk to you about how to do it if you have questions or if the materials don't make sense. So that's, it's, I know I'm trying to make a sales pitch, but I'm trying to tie it into the fact that as nurses, we need to get the type, types of blood in our system that we don't have right now. 
We have very little blood supply from minority populations, which is why we just give a universal donor, just to try to get them to not bleed to death, but in the long run, we're hurting our patients. If they are not getting that matched blood on those antibodies, and I'm not saying 100% of these people have those unique antibodies, but we should be testing for them and make sure if you have one of those rare antibodies that your blood is marked as racial uh, group because a lot of people won't check the racial group on their donation form or on a computer that they're doing it that way. So we need to educate people about why, talk about these rare antibodies, and then hopefully keep the number of transmission reactions down. So that's a short, short version of this. I could go through and give the entire presentation, but I think that would put people to sleep. Uh, do you have any questions? Does this sound like a program you might like to do in your own community? Anybody have a group they'd like to present to? Very quiet. I'll tell you, if, um, if you want to contact me, I'm at the university, and I don't have my email up here, but it's Schmidt, Cheryl K, at uams.edu, and you can write it down afterwards if you want to connect with me. Any questions? Yes, sir. We, we do a lot of health fairs, Doc. I was wondering what would be the possibilities of setting up a drive at uh, some of the larger health fairs? That's commonly what they do because they're already drawing people interested in health and if you would have to have an indoor area so they could have their electricity and you know the coolers for the blood donations and have some privacy for the history part. So like a church hall with little side rooms for your Sunday school would be great for doing the history part. Um, and you could put, they bring their own cots, they bring everything, they bring all the furniture, all they need are volunteers. <coughs> So connect with our local chapter here, our blood services. If you go to that 748-1000, and then they'll have a menu, and it'll say for blood donations, dial five or whatever the number is. Okay. okay. But that would be a great way, because people are already health conscious, or at least talk to them about the value of giving blood. And maybe get one of the handouts and have it there saying we need more minority donations. We need more donations, period. But we are very short on minority group donations. Any other questions? That's it. Thank you. Dr. Smith, I would like to present this to you from the Little Life Black Nurses. Well, thank you. Thank you. My appreciation. Thank you. I love her name. <laughs> Same spelling. I don't know if you're aware, Lana Turner's daughter is named Cheryl. And they picked that name on a national competition. You know, she was a movie star back in the 40s. And uh, they chose Cheryl. And that was the new name of the year. So everybody, I don't know when you were born, but I was born in 49. And that was the big new name that year. There was no Cheryl before 49. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. I think uh, one of the things I learned from your presentation is that there is hope on the horizon. Did you, did you guys realize what she was saying there was, there is, hope on the horizon? Do you feel that way? Yes. I'm sure you do. Sure, why don't you come back up? Tonight is your night. Oh, yeah. I win the lottery? No, you didn't win the lottery, but you had to meet Ken Wayne. That's true. That's pretty close. <laughs> but uh, we just have a small token for you from uh, uh, Linda Conley, the executive director. And uh, just our, our small way of saying thank you for being here. Thank you. And thank you for giving us hope on the horizon. Thank you very much. All right, let's give her a hand. Thank you.